you know, here I am, uh, your, your dear uh, meetup organizer. Uh, you know, and, and one of the big reasons why I wanted to actually have a Silicon Valley meetup and why I really enjoy speaking at Ember Meetups is to keep the community up to date with what's happening uh, in the Ember world. I think there's a lot of things happening. It's hard to keep up to date with like what's the latest thing going on or what are the plans and how are we getting from here to there. Um, and so, you know, we're lucky that we happen to have a couple core team members in the Bay Area that can come and speak at our meetups in San Francisco and Silicon Valley and kind of, you know, disseminate all of the secret plans that the core team is devising in our secret lair. Um, so because, you know, this is an open source project, but of course we operate in secrecy. So um, just kidding. Um, but so this should feel a little bit like deja vu because it turns out actually that the first meetup we had here in Silicon Valley, I gave a talk called Ember 1.10 and beyond. And really that was kind of me bringing uh, the latest news to you guys here. And so uh, that was January 28th, and I'm happy to report we shipped 1.10 uh, just a week after that, roughly, on February 7th. And so uh, who's here on 1.10 still? Is anybody still on 1.10? No? OK. Well, we shipped 1.11 not too long after that uh, f on April 4th. Who's on 1.11 now? Most of you should be, right? Because this is the current stable release. Uh, 1.11.3, actually, I believe, is the stable release now. Um, you might want to upgrade there. Um, so let's talk a little bit. Uh, I, in my last talk, I talked about, a lot about 110 and, and beyond. And so I covered some of this stuff. So I'm just going to briefly go over it. And so in 110, uh, we had some features. In 111, we had a lot of cool other cool features, such as bound attribute syntax. That's basically the TLDR of that is death to bind adder. May it rest in peace. Uh, and we added the inline if helper, which Ed showed off during his talk, which is great uh, for doing things that bind adder allowed you to do with classes. Um, we added an index pro uh, argument to the block params from the each helper, which was a long asked for feature. It just took us 11 releases or so to get it. No problem, guys. Um, you're welcome. Uh, so. Named substates, uh, this is basically a router loading and error state uh, feature. I'm not going to dive too much into, but that's cool if you're into those things. Uh, and then the component helper, uh, which was basically a great way if you were doing funky switch statement type things in your templates and you wanted to render a different component depending on some data, the component helper made that super easy to do so. Um, and so very soon, we're going to have Ember 112. And so if you don't know, Ember runs on a six-week release cycle. So there's always a new re release basically every six weeks. And so roughly six weeks after 111, we're going to have uh, 112. And that's actually coming up next week. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what's coming in 112. We've got a uh, nice new computed syntax that I believe Steph here at championed for the most part. Um, we've got some other more wonky features that I'm not going to really talk about, but you know they're there. Um, so 113 is coming on this date that may live in infamy, June 12th. Um, and so uh, 113 is going to have a bunch of awesome features. Uh, the major one is the Glimmer rendering engine. And it turns out, if you're following along at home, we're inches away from merging Glimmer in New Canary, apparently. So that's cool. Um, and uh, you know, it's going to have some other features, too, as well, hopefully. Uh, routable components being one of them. And we'll talk more about those in a bit. HTML style component invocation. Uh, by the way, I stole these bullet points from Ed. So thank you, Ed. Um, he gave a similar talk in Boston. I would have called this angle bracket style components. Uh, so basically what this means is you're going to be able to invoke Ember components instead of with curlies with custom element syntax. So it'll just look like HTML. It's going to be a great day when we land that. That is a long time coming. Uh, so if I had hair, it would be gray. Um, One-way data flow is also coming along with that, and we'll talk maybe a little bit about that. Probably not, because we're short on time. Component adders is all, all related. So these three bullet points are all basically related to HTML style in component invocation, as Ed likes to call it. And basically, the concept is, is that we have some new features that we want to have you guys utilize. And by opting in to using the HTML style syntax, you are now going to be opting in for to one-way data flow and your attributes to be passed to you as this.adders instead of 
all of those uh, properties being passed in directly onto the component instance itself. So um, all this stuff has pretty much been talked about, uh, and we'll, I'll show, give you some links in a second. Um, and then new component lifecycle hooks, that's kind of related to Glimmer. I'm not going to talk much about that. There will be plenty of information, I'm sure, shortly after Glimmer launches about that stuff. So I said Ember 113 was on June 12th, but it turns out, if you're familiar with the Ember release cycle, we also release the first beta of the next forthcoming stable release at the same time. And so June 12th is the day that will live in infamy, hopefully, or it will be the day that we eat crow and don't actually ship on time, uh, Ember 2.0 beta 1. And so what are the features coming in Ember 2.0? Does anybody know? Undefined is not a function, not a number, minus one. There are zilch, zero, nada, no features in Ember 2.0. No features for you. You haven't earned them. So who's confused by this right now? Who's confused? All right, I know more of you are probably, right? The reason I'm giving this talk is because I want to make sure that people understand exactly what 2.0 means and how it's going to work, because it's actually pretty cool and innovative if you're familiar uh, with some other competing projects 2.0s. They don't necessarily work like this. Um, so, so what's going on here? Show me the 2.0 features. Well, it turns out that Ember 113 is actually Ember 2.0 in disguise. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, so what do I mean? Well, you're going to hear, and you've probably heard us, championing, championing this phrase, stability without stagnation. And so hopefully you'll grok a little better, perhaps, by what we mean when we say this after I'm done describing how Ember 2.0 is going to work. Ember 2.0 is not a big bang release. We do not believe that you, as app developers, should have to use long-lived branches to upgrade to Ember 2.0. We do not believe you should have to rewrite your application to use Ember 2.0. And we certainly don't want you to be agile. I mean, wait, no, we want you to be agile. In fact, we've agiled your upgrade for you. So how do they work? How do Ember upgrades work? Who's upgraded an Ember app here? Raise your hand. All right, great. How do they work? Deprecations. Um, so the wonderful world of deprecations. So what do we mean? Well, let's talk a little bit about the deprecations that we've seen recently. So 111 was pretty tame. Object controller. So <laughs> good point. <laughs> good point. Uh, who, has, who has successfully removed all their object controller def deprecations currently? All right, pretty good. That's pretty good. Well, you, did you have any to begin with? No, all right, sounds good. <laughs> I just wrote a new app. Turns out I didn't use controllers. Great. Um, so, 112, list is getting longer. So, what's going on here? Well, really, what we're talking when the upgrade path to Ember 2.0 is really about upgrading your Ember apps to the latest version of Ember 1X and removing all of the deprecation warnings, right? So the idea is you can iteratively upgrade. Deprecation warnings are just console spew, spew, right? Which is what those rainbows are representing, the console spew of deprecations. Unless you've got the Ember inspector installed. If you've got the Ember inspector installed, then we actually aggregate and group and keep give you a nice round number of the number of times those deprecations are occurring in your application. We let you click in and see the actual line in your app that's triggering that deprecation in maybe most circumstances, but not every. Um, so we've got some planned deprecations. And if you're familiar with the Ember 2.0 plan, you, these aren't going to be surprises to you. So basically, we've got a new feature called block params. So with foo as bar and each foo in foos, these are syntaxes that have lived with us for quite a while in Ember. We've unified them with block params. So instead of each foo and foos and with foo as bar, it's actually with foo as pipes bar and each foos as pipes bar, our foo. So I'll show you some syntax in a minute. Bind adder, we're deprecating it. So you can still use it, right? 
but you're going to get counsel spew because you should probably be using the new attribute binding syntax and the inline ifs for that kind of stuff. Render, the render helper, I hate. I've never used it. I wish it didn't ever exist, but it exists, and you might be using it, and you should stop. What should you do instead? You should use a component. So that's nice. Array controller, this is a another minor deprecation. Uh, so basically, the story for you uh, today, my dear community members, is to, if you don't want to get rid of controllers completely, you want to stop using these fancy proxying controllers, like object controller and array controller, you want to start using Ember controller. And so that might be an easier migration path for you than eliminating controllers together altogether. And you know the good news is that don't worry, you can actually still use object controllers and array controllers if you absolutely want to. They're going to be pluginified, and and they'll be available to you if you want to upgrade Ember 2.0 while still utilizing that code. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, this dot resource was news to me actually. Uh, it's apparently getting deprecated. That sounds great because I've hated it since the day, the first day. Uh, and the only reason we had it was because it allowed nesting. And now route, this dot route allows nesting, although it has a caveat, which is that it doesn't let you reset the namespace. But it turns out we have a nice private API that you can use. If you just pass reset namespace true, that will work. So I didn't know that. Mixonic told me that. And I said, why isn't that documented? And then Robert Jackson chimed in and said, that's private. And I'm like, you should probably underscore it then, because it sure looks public to me. Um, so. That's cool. Don't use resource anymore. Just use route. Um, and then we've deprecated some uh, internals, some view internals. Like if you and override the render function and you push strings into the buffer with HTML bars, now we build DOM. So you should use DOM instead of just plain strings. It's just deprecated, of course. So these still works today. Then needs. Needs is a big one. We'll talk a bit uh, about services. I actually don't think I have an injection example, but. Google uh, ember.inject.controller, that's the replacement for needs. Uh, it's pretty simple. It's a lot nicer, actually, than needs was. Um, so that's great. And then array computed and reduced computed, they're getting re uh, removed and put into a plugin if you absolutely need them. I do not recommend using them. You should uh, use them until Glimmer lands, and then likely Glimmer will make them unnecessary due to Glimmer's virtual DOM implementation. So that's cool. So that's 112, and then these are some of the, the planned things for 112. These are some of the planned things for 113. Uh, basically, all controllers are going to go away in 113. And so one thing to note here is that you can still have controllers in your app, and they'll still work in Ember 2.0. We're going to spew deprecation warnings about it because we would ideally like to prompt you. If you have a small app, it's not a big deal to mechanically refactor your controllers to services and components. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. But if you absolutely, if you think it's too gargantuan of a task, there's going to be an Ember add-on that basically gives you controllers in Ember 2.0. And the cool thing is that once somebody gets around to writing that plugin, it will actually disable the deprecations in 1x. So you'll install the add-on. It will disable the deprecations, which will get the console and the Ember inspector off your back and all your coworkers that don't understand how Ember's upgrade process works. And then in 2.0, it will include the code that's no longer in 2.0. So it's a very clever hack, basically, for how we can remove something that we consider now unnecessary for Ember 2.0, but it keeps you and your app working none the wiser, right? So. Um, you're going to see with the angle bracket stuff, um, when that lands, there's also, you know, we're going to be moving to adders inside of components. And so we'll start deprecating the use of properties without prefixing adders to them. And basically, 113 is the last Ember release uh, in the 1x series, hopefully. Um, and basically, anything we don't want in Ember 2.0 meaning anything we're not going to support for probably a year and a half to two years, we need to get gone because Ember 3. Point, we'll be stuck supporting it until Ember 3.0. So it's the last call for any of the cruft that we want out. So if you have some ideas, let us know, ideally before we branch for 113. 
or I guess not really branch, it's before the stable release, so throughout the beta series. So 2.0, we know it has new fe no features. What's the point? Well, the philosophy is up here pretty much. You should go read the RFC if you haven't yet. Um, there's a few things here, you know, this is, it's a really, you know, we, it's a well thought out document with the core team actually put together while we were, I believe in Chicago together, uh, discussing our plans for 2.0 and Tom did a great job of writing up everything basically for us. And so it's a pretty long document and there's a lot of comments on it. So if you're interested, I think we've flocked the thread now, but there's a lot of important philosophical things about Ember. So if you haven't read this, you should definitely read it. Um, and, you know, so I'm not going to talk too much about it, but the important thing to note here is that you don't, even though Ember 2.0 is uh, coming out on June 12th, you don't have to wait. Oh, wait a second. I forgot to tweet that I was speaking live. Hold on. Self-promotion time. All right. There we go. Um, so, um, I planned that. Uh, so, you don't have to wait for Ember 2.0. You can, you're actually already using it today. Asterix. Uh, some of it, some of it you're using today probably, right? And so let's go a little bit, let's go through the RFC real quick. Let's look at the scorecard here. How are we doing for Ember 2.0? Um, yikes. Ooh, there we go. Now my phone's vibrating. I think I must have tweeted something popular. Um, so basically, there's a pretty decent list right here, actually, which is kind of like the high-level set of improvements that we are shooting for. And so the first one was more intuitive attribute bindings. We did it. It shipped. What was it? 111, right? It shipped in 111. And so, Jesus Christ. Uh, stop tweeting, people. Um, so we've already shipped that one. Done. That's a 2.0 feature that you're using today already. New HTML syntax for components. I said that's a Glimmer feature, and that's sh slotted for th 113. So you're going to get that in 113. Block params. That was old school. That's like 1.9, I think, right? More consistent template scope. That was related to block params. The idea is that we're gonna de we've deprecated all the different forms of helpers that can change what this is inside of the template. So it's very clear. You can look at a template. You know where the properties are coming from. It's very straightforward. One-way binding by default with opt-in mutable two-way bindings. That's a 113 feature. That's going to land in 113. More explicit communication, which means less, less implicit communication via two-way bindings. This is basically data downs act actions up, I think. That's another way to summarize this. This is part of the 113 story with Glimmer. Route-driven components instead of controllers and templates. That's part of 113. Routable components and improved actions. I'm not going to talk much about them, but basically, I think Ed actually actually mentioned them. Actually, actually. He actually mentioned them. Uh, basically, the idea is we pass, we're going to pass actions as data, which we kind of already are doing. But instead of the data being a string, the data is going to actually be a bound function that you can call. And so you can pass that thing around, and you can call it from other components as well, which is going to be nice for composability and yada, yada, yada. So, I think we're doing pretty good on the uh, 2.0 scorecard. So, you know, if it's not clear, a lot of those features, you know, if you upgrade to 1.13, you're going to be using them before 2.0 comes out. And so, you know, of course, Ember 2.0 is coming out to, uh, coming to an NPM near you. And the joke is it's actually probably going to go to Bauer first, but <laughs> <laughs> Steph's going to make it go to NPM, uh, right? We're going to get on NPM one of these days, right? Okay, yeah. If you want to use Ember 0.9, you can get it on NPM. Ember 2.0, though, will be the next release on NPM, hopefully. Um, or maybe we'll even get 1, 1x. Oh, Chad's fixing it. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> All right. So how do you prepare for Ember 2.0? You upgrade to 1.13. That's it. And what else? Well, you either opt in to the old functionality, like controllers, and as we'll talk about in a second, views, by using the plugins that we're going to publish for that, which will dis disable the deprecation messages, right? And give you, when you upgrade to 2.0, the code that you need to actually use them still. 
and you're good to go. That's it. Just upgrade to 113 and you're good. Do you believe me? In theory, this is how it should work. We're not perfect, we're human, we're flawed human beings just like everyone else. We'll do our best to make that the reality. And that's really the philosophy behind how we want you to consume Ember, right? We don't want you to spend weeks trying to upgrade. We want you to ideally be able to upgrade within a, your sprints, right? So, of course, those all, all of that is tentative to your use or lack of use of private APIs, right? So if you're using private APIs, you probably will get burnt. So we'll do our best to help you out. We really actually do take careful consideration with private API removal. We actually like deprecate it vo vocally like it was a, pri a public API, and then we remove it after a, a release. And so one thing I should have mentioned is that you should usually upgrade piecemeal, version by version, because if you happen to be using a private API unknowingly, like uh, reset namespace, <laughs> if they're not underscored, how do you know they're private? Um, so you should upgrade piece by, uh, piecemeal, version by version, because you'll catch some of those deprecations and you know, maybe if there's bugs, you'll catch them you know, uh, earlier rather than later. And so in theory, it shouldn't be too bad. So let's talk about controllers, because as, as you've heard, right, controllers are gone. And part of that's because of this freaking question, which is, when should I use a controller versus a component, Eric? They're gone, no more, never again will I hear that question. And it's gonna be a glorious day because why? I don't know. Single responsibility principle, dude. Controllers, they violated them. All those neckbeards. Look at this guy with this neckbeard. Jesus Christ. Um, how would anybody get on the stage with that kind of beard? Gross. Um, so SRP, right? The single responsibility principle. It turns out controllers kind of had mixed responsibilities. And this was kind of evolutionary. And it was also kind of inherited. Um, but basically, controllers have two responsibilities. Persisting, per keeping persistent app state, right? And that's why query parameters are an API of controllers because query parameters are a mechanism for serializing additional application state out to the URL so that that each state is shareable and it will live across refreshes of the page, right? Um, but it, they're also used for decorating data in, that you use inside of your templates. And so people look at these, people that you know understand how controllers work, they look at these two things and they're like, hmm, well, one of these things is not like the other and one of those things I already can do in another way. And so, you know, really, it turns out in Ember 2.0, or actually, I should say in Ember 1.0, nothing's Ember 2.0, because all the features are in 1.0, right? In today's Ember, you can actually start splitting these concerns across two different objects. And those are components and services. And so services, let's talk about, they're the, sing they're the new singletons that can contain app persistent application state, right? So if you were using uh, a controller to keep track of a value, right? And so when you left the route and you came back, that value was still there. Services are your new main man. And the cool thing about services is that you no longer have to have like these arbitrary non-route driven controllers, which was like terminology that was evolutionary in a way. The common thing was like to have a non-route routable controller that acted like what a service is today that you would put state on, and then you would needs it in to everything else that wanted it. It was a terrible idea. We have services now. Everything's amazing. Everything is amazing, FYI, in Ember 2.0. Actually, I mean, in Ember 1, 1x, everything's still amazing. It's going to be even more amazing when we can drop all that code. Um, so components are the things that decorate data. These are the things we, you know, when we were looking at that list, we're like, hmm, that sounds familiar. I've seen that before somewhere else, and that's in a component, right? And so this was kind of the annoying thing. This is why people ask that question. What's the difference between a controller and a component? Why do I use one or the other? There was a legitimate question there. And it was frustrating as a member of the, you know, the core team to hear that question because there's no good reason why you should have had to choose. And so Ember 2.0, and I got to stop saying Ember 2.0. Um, basically, we agree and, you know, we, uh, we have learned 
the sins of our ways, and we have made there be one true way to decorate data, and that is a component. Um, and of course, components also do things like handling your DOM events, your low-level events, and your uh, high-level application actions, right, for your templates. So views. This is the next, I could have had another slide, is like, so when do I use a view versus a component? That was another great question. The answer is, shoot me. Um, they're being replaced by components. Um, and, you know, so usually the only reason that you ever used a view was because it turned out your route, your route, uh, your routes templates, those used a view to render them instead of a component. And that was primarily legacy, right? Ember has been an evolution, right? We've been at it for four years now, almost. I've been at it with everybody else for four years, and man, like I said, I lost my hair. I did, it just didn't have a chance to go gray first. Um, but their, re their views are getting replaced by components. It's going to be a beautiful, wonderful day, uh, especially when we land routable components. And so that's a big 113 feature that somebody's supposed to be working on. I don't know who. Um, I think it was me, actually. Uh, Yes, Alex and I, Alex Machinier and I have been working on it. Um, I have had copious amounts of free time to do this as well. So um, it's coming soon. In fact, uh, there is an add-on if you want to play with them. I wrote an add-on called Ember Routable Components, which is actually extracted from some hacks that I had to put together to actually do a 2.0 training here at LinkedIn. So that's actually an add-on that you can play with if you want. Um, so. Go forth and try it. It's got. It's, I don't suggest really using it in production, unless you want to fix the bugs. But really, we just need to work on router components and not worry about that add-on too much. And so, you know, this is just a very high-level conceptual, uh, you know, lesson in how to migrate to 2.0. Of course, the devil's in the details, but for the most part, these simple concepts here that I've talked about, like that's the story for migrating. Plugins will remove your deprecations. They'll allow you to use the existing controllers and view code inside of 2.0 if you need it. If you've got a smaller app, you can migrate. The intention of all these migrations uh, from these deprecated APIs is that they should be mechanical refactorings. What do we mean by that? We mean you should basically be able to write regexes to, or like sed or whatever scripts to do them um, within you know, there's probably some caveats here or there, right? But the idea is we don't want to leave you behind, our loyal 1.x users, and we want to bring you with us to 2.0 to a better land. And so we take it very seriously. And so please, you know, there's more information to come on the migration, on the migration strategy. You should nag us all the time about getting good documentation and migration guides. Uh, when 2.0 lands or up to the road to 2.0 and you know share your experiences so you know I consider if you know the lack of documentation or information a bug so if you feel like you're discovering things you're having trouble you should definitely let us know so that we can try to address that and if you're interested in helping document your struggles or your path to 2.0 please get in touch so and test the betas please so Thank you very much. Um, turns out, if you're interested, I'm giving Ember 2.0 training here in Silicon Valley in early June, hopefully. I'm working out the venue details, so you can get that information on my website. Um, and just one final PSA from our dear friend, Stephen Seven Penner. Don't use observers. Just don't. And well, that's a whole talk in itself that maybe Steph will give to us next month or something. So, um, so yeah, that's all. Any uh, questions? All right. Um, so, um, any thoughts real quick on sortable mixing and array control? Ooh, that's a good one. Mm. They shouldn't be necessary. They, are those not deprecated yet? They should definitely be deprecated. Um, Glimmer makes them unnecessary. Basically, all of the array computed stuff, all the fancy sorting and arrangable mixing or whatever form of it you're using, <laughs> that's an inside joke. Um, those things don't need to exist anymore because Glimmer knows how to watch your uh, array manipulations, 
you know, for you without them needing to be observable. So those kinds that all that complexity is gone with Glimmer. That was one of the gifts that React has given us, basically, the reactification of Ember. So yes. Uh, component helper plus uh, mutable properties versus non-mutable properties. Say what? So angle bracket syntax is going to opt in to. Uh, um, are you asking, like, will the component helper be one way or two way by default? Yes. Uh, good question. Uh, you should lob that troll bomb at Yehuda, um, <laughs> who's working on this right now. Uh, so I think the answer is probably going to have to be that they're going to be two-way by default, and we might need to invent something new to make them one-way by default and then deprecate. This is the trouble with adding APIs right as we're in the middle of transitioning the uh, framework's concepts. So, so yeah, hopefully there's going to be a little bit of not too much. I like to think of all this stuff as creative destruction, right? This is creative destruction we're going through here, and it's a necessary... Uh, it's a necessary thing in the creative arts, such as these. So what's up, Chad? Uh, so if you're going to be able to just pass around values, why do you even need CPs anymore, like computer ah, properties? Ooh, you're just giving me all the questions I want to answer. Um, so uh, my opinion is that I hope someday we will be able to kill computed properties um, because we can just use ES5 getters. I didn't talk about IE8. But IE8 was the last bastion of the thing keeping us from, I guess that's not mixing metaphors maybe, but it was the last thing that was keeping us from using and relying on ES5 features in the framework and in our documentation. And so my hope is that some use, some case of things that you're writing as computed properties will just be able to get be getters in JavaScript, just use the language, right? Now, computed properties have some nice benefits, primarily memoization. And so Ember is going to have this kind of hybrid observation system now. So, you know, we are we have adopted a lot of like the reactification. We've had some reactification, this data down actions up stuff, but we still rely heavily on KVO on in libraries like Ember Data. And so, our templating and component layer needs to support both of these notification systems basically. You know, the data down actions up model or set state if you want to call it that, if you're familiar with it and KVO. And so computed properties are an important aspect in us still supporting the KVO use case. So, you know, if you're passing in a, an observable object like a number data model and you're keying into that inside of a pro computed property, you likely want to have efficient observation of that. The template re-rendering is not going to noti like won't be notified necessarily if Ember data models change. So there's still kind of this hybrid system. We like to think of it as the best of both worlds, um, but we'll see what happens. So TLDR is they're still kind of necessary, but for some case, you, for some and hopefully many cases, especially when the, you're talking about data that's purely computed based off of component props or component adders, you will not need computed properties. You can just use getters. They'll work. Yes. Just not a question, but a, a further statement on that. Getters become computed properties. They become the same thing. Except for memoization. Well, you so for example, with um, ES7 uh, decorators, yeah. you can That's decorate in. any descriptor, which is a JavaScript um, construct to, to, to say what a property is supposed to do, to have any sort of functionality. So I think it... Lodash, for example, has a memoize thing because it's useful. Um, yeah. So I suspect what will end up happening is computer properties will be pushed down into property descriptors that will have memoization and potentially have keys for cache busting. So they'll, I think they'll be so, somewhat related to what we have today, but they'll morph along with our what, KVO and notification strategy choices as we move forward. What Steph is talking about right now is basically, you know, when you're writing, you know, if you have like an Ember object. Can you make um, it yeah, I'll make it bigger. I should probably just use a text editor, but I have the browser open. So, um, so when you're you know exporting your uh, Ember objects, um, this is kind of weird to program to a remote screen. Maybe I will turn off mirroring. Or turn on mirroring. All right. So when you're creating a computed property, right, you're probably doing either one of two things. You're doing something like this, which is not great. I, this is one of the things I should have probably talked about. You should probably switch to you not use it, relying on um, the 
uh, prototype extensions. So you know you basically wrap Ember computed around your function that turns it into a computed property, right? And you can pass your dependent keys, right? Your cache busting your your cache busting value, right? Your cache busting properties as you know the arg as uh, some var args before the function, right? And so this function will get recomputed every time one of those properties changes and the computed property is requested. Otherwise, we memoize, we re remember, we cache that value basically for you. And so we only ever run computed properties as necessary, right? Hopefully everybody knows that already. Um, so we have a nice planned mechanical refactoring for you when we start assuming ES7 functionality. And that is that you know, we, so let's talk about getters real quick. So I was saying you can use language features once we drop i8, and that basically means, you know, my getter, right? So you can just write that. And if you're relying on properties, if this was a component, let's say, and you're relying on properties that are on adders only, so let's say we were doing, you know, adders, first name, and we'll use even fancier fan syntax here, right? For relying on adders, something like this will just work. We can actually use my getter. We can go into a template. We can say, you know, um, my getter. And that will actually just work today. You can actually do that today, I believe. So this works today. What's the problem? Well, one, it's recomputed every time, right? And um, so some things you want to cache because they might be expensive to recompute. And so that kind of concept is built in Amber Computer Properties. Um, so you can do this, but what Steph was alluding to is that with ES7, there's going to be a new feature called annotation uh, decorators. Be careful. And so basically, you'll be able to just do this instead. And so you can basically start with a getter in theory, and if you need to worry about integrating with our KVO observation layer, you can just decorate that getter with this um, computed, you know, decorator, pass the dependent keys, and this syntax of your will be gone. The nice thing is that this is a super easy mechanical refactoring, right? Because all you basically need to do is cut this crap out, do that, do that, and now, and add get here, and you've upgraded to the newer syntax. So this is what we kind of mean by our mechanical refactoring, right? It should be, you shouldn't have to think too hard. You can have a few beers. You can knock it out after work or something, right? Or on the weekend. So. Ember Watson is a project by Adolfo that does a lot of these transforms for yeah. you as your upgrade process. Once recast supports the syntax, this will just be something you don't even have. To, it, you don't even have the opportunity to do the beer because we will do it. Faster. It turns out the Ember community has some members that know Perl really well. So <laughs> just kidding. I think they're probably using AST transforms this or something. Right? So. If there's actually a plugin, yeah. if you want to be fancy, I believe our friend Senor, actually, if I go to Ember add-ons, that'll probably be the easiest way. Our friend, our friend Senor Robert Jackson, also on the core team, has this nice cool thing called Ember, Ember Computed Decorators. And so this actually starts letting you, if you opt in to Babel to turn on this feature, which is currently in like proposals on the standards bodies, you can opt in, and now you can start using that stuff today. It, it, it even supports uh, Ember Data's adder syntax. Cool. Awesome. So yeah, this is very neat. Use it at your own risk. Uh, so just to clarify, yeah. uh, is that reasoning the same for observers? So would you still use? Yes. In theory, we will have that, but we would, if well, if some of us have our ways, we will not have observers in a future version of Ember. Probably not till 3.0, but who knows? We'll see. You only need observers when you're interacting with the outside world. If you're interacting with the D3 plugin, if you're interacting with the jQuery plugin, other than that, you have precisely zero reason to have <laughs> Observers are kind of like this thing that you know, most of us regret. You need to build a complex system, but they're a primitive that's very unwieldy, and yeah. almost every circumstance, if you convert it to a computer property, all your problems go away. Yeah, the TLDR of observers are use computed properties instead. Try as hard as you humanly possibly can to use an uh, to use a computed property. They are a much better primitive than an observer. And honestly, I think a good chunk of the core team probably regrets making observers as sugary as they are. We've kind of inherited that from Sprout Core, unfortunately. 
we would have made you manually do Ember at Observer and remove Observer, but then you would probably have never removed them, and then you would memory leak all over the place, which is probably the reason why we had this sugar um, to begin with. So, so yeah. Does that answer your question? Yep. Yeah. That's a preview for next month. <laughs> yeah, that's a preview of Steph's rant for, at next month's meetup, perhaps. So, all right, folks. Thanks for coming out. Sorry for keeping you late. Um,